All right, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Department of Medicine uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, uh, our speaker today is Dr. Uh, Paula Marquis, who's uh, uh, in the Division of Neurology, uh, working as an epileptologist. Uh, Dr. Marquis uh, completed her medical school as well as residency training in neurology in uh, Brazil. Uh, following that, she moved to Canada, where she completed a fellowship in epilepsy genetics at the University of Toronto and started uh, uh, research uh, at the University of Toronto until 2023, uh, when she moved to McMaster University. So she's one of our uh, new recruits. Uh, Dr. McKee's uh, main research interest is in uh, genetics and epilepsy. Uh, which uh, includes areas such as long-term outcomes in genetics epilepsy, transition from epidiatric to adult care, and impact of genetics, uh, genetic diagnosis on uh, surgical uh, outcomes. Uh, and she's passionate about epilepsy in women and have just started uh, a woman epilepsy clinic in collaboration with obstetrics, uh, our obstetrical team, and uh, tuberous sclerosis, sorry, uh, clinic. Uh, so no surprise, uh, Dr. Marquis is going to be talking about to us today about tuberous sclerosis, complex challenges and future direction, uh, topic of an interest. So I uh, will pass it on to Dr. Marquis. Uh, Paula, please go ahead. Thank you so much. I'll just share my slides. All right. So thank you everyone for being here today. So I've chosen to to talk about tuber sclerosis, uh, considering the complexity of its care and try to bring some new, not new, but some perspectives into this um, very difficult to treat condition uh, since I started the, this clinic last August here at McMaster. So I'll start with a brief introduction about the condition. And I just want to acknowledge that we are situated upon the traditional territories of uh, Hadino, Sauni, and Mississaugas, the land discovered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement between, I can say the name, and all of us uh, on this land to share and care for the resources around the great lands. Please take a moment to reflect and give thanks for those who have come before on the lands on which you currently reside. And then moving on, um, so just a brief introduction about tuber sclerosis complex. It is a rare genetic disorder that can affect any organ system, which will uh, translate into its complexity. The incidence is between one to every 6,000 to one to every 10,000 live births. It is an autosomal dominant mutation, but that doesn't mean it is inherited as a lot of the cases uh, as high as two thirds of them are sporadic and we see what we call the novel mutations. Um, and this condition will increase the predisposition to hamartoma formation um, by changing the mTOR uh, pathway as you see on the on the illustration. And uh, there are two known mutations that are related to tuberous sclerosis, uh, tuberous sclerosis uh, one and two. So as you see in this uh, figure, um, the, the mTOR pathway, uh, there are two um, main mutations that will cause abnormalities on tuberin and harmatin, depending on which gene, and then that will translate into more cell growth and proliferation, which is why those patients will end up having a lot of those uh, tumors in many organs. Uh, in terms of history, it has come a long way, but the first description of tuberous sclerosis is from 18, 1835 uh, by Pierre Hayet, uh, when he published an atlas of skin diseases and uh, named uh, some of the facial angiofibromas. Then the first time it was actually called tuberous sclerosis complex was only in 1942, when it was acknowledged that all the symptoms could be a part of the same condition. And then it progressed 
in a sense that in 1966 already we we had epilepsy surgery for tuberous sclerosis. In 1971 is when there was a hypothesis of the two hit uh, mechanism for tuberous sclerosis that I can briefly go over after. And then 1985, five years after uh, MRI started uh, being used, it was when it was first used for TSC. And then some of the uh, brain malformations, um, brain abnormalities were described. And then moving on, 1987 um, was when... Um, Sorry, 19, I think this, this date is wrong, but there was a description, um, 1987, there was a description of the probable gene on chromosome nine. And then in 1990 um, was when vigabatrin was seen to be highly effective for infantile spasms. Then 1992, it was the, the description of the second gene in chromosome 16. Then in 2002, there was a great discovery that rapamycin was um was found to shrink tumors in rat and mouse and then uh later on four years after that was when uh some trials started and it was found that it can actually shrink angiomyelin lipomas and astrocytomas as well so there's a lot of hallmarks in terms of the history of tsc and uh treatment has come a long way when it comes to that so I'll just go over this uh Clinical features of TSC are, are very extensive and I won't be able to summarize all of them, but this, this illustration kind of gives an overview how it can affect pretty much every single organ and system um, in the body, uh, with some of them being more common and more easy to recognize in patients with TSC. I'll quickly go over some of the images. Um, the skin lesions often are the reason why the diagnosis is suspected. So angiofibromas, for example, are quite common in those patients, as well as periungal fibromas. So this has to be something that you keep in mind when examining those patients, because they may not necessarily tell you, and they may think this is something normal, like, um, like other people would also have those fibromas. Then we also have chagrin patches that may look like one of those um, images and the ash leaf um, marks as well, which um, are hypomelanotic lesions. So the skin, uh, the skin abnormalities, they can occur in up to 90 or even more uh, percent of those patients. And like I said, they they are often the reason why the condition is diagnosed, but they can be very mild as well. So it, this has to be kept in mind. When it comes to brain manifestations, um, sometimes those patients, uh, a lot of times they will develop epilepsy. And then when the imaging is done, uh, that could be when the first suspicion of TSC also um, happens. So for instance, in this imaging, we see some hyperintensities in the cortex of the brain. So it's usually good to see on, on T2 and flare images. And those are what we call cortical tubers. So they're not well-defined uh, tumors, but they will cause those hyperintensities. So anytime you see those abnormalities, do remember about uh, tubers they will present in, in up to 95% of the patients uh, with TSC. They are benign, but sometimes they uh, have to be surgically resected in some cases that epilepsy is refractory if, if it can be proven that that tuber is the one causing the seizures. Another one that is a little bit less common is SEGA, so it's a subependymal um, giant astrocytoma, which um, sometimes does not require surgical intervention. It is uh, this mass that you see inside uh, the ventricle. It can cause obstruction in hydrocephalus, but uh, oftentimes it is monitored with imaging, and if there's no impact um, in terms of symptoms and hydrocephaly, uh, sometimes the follow-ups are just with imaging. And there are cases where um, everolimus can also be prescribed to try to shrink the size. 
and there are often cases where um, it's needed surgical resection. Another typical manifestation is subependymal nodules. So they are seen here in, in those images in the CT. They can be actually calcified, so they will, they will appear uh, white. And also on the brain MRI, they will like look like those bulging um, images on the lateral ventricles. So they, those are also very typical. Another one is the eye, the retinal hematoma, which can be seen by ophthalmologists. So if you try um, a fundoscopy, you may be able to see it if it's big enough. Um, a typical one as well that is often the reason why patients are diagnosed, even in utero, is the cardiac rhabdomyoma. So sometimes uh, when a fetal ultrasound is done, if a mass is seen inside the, the, the heart of the baby, such as shown here, that's when um, a suspicion is made of tuberous sclerosis. Another typical one that uh, is a big reason for uh, morbidity in those patients is the renal manifestations, such as angiomyolipomas. In this case, a very severe uh, disease of the kidney, so it can cause kidney failure, needing transplantation, and uh, other abnormalities as well. You can also have cysts. So in terms of diagnostic criteria, I'm not going to go over it very much in detail, but this is the the revised one. Um, so there's some major criteria. A lot of them are skin. There's some of the brain ones, such as the subependymal nodule, uh, the, the subependymal giant astrocytoma. And uh, you need two major features or one major feature with two minor. And then uh, some of the minor are related to skin. And um, you can also have scleric bone lesions. I'm not again. I'm not going to go over all of that uh, because um, this is this would make the the presentation very extensive, and I don't think this is the the goal for this presentation. But uh, this has been revised a few times um, in terms of making uh, those criteria very uh, sensitive. And it is a clinical diagnosis, but also another way of making diagnosis is by identifying TSC one or two. That's also sufficient, even if even if you don't fill fill all the criteria for um, diagnostics, as I showed in the previous slide. And that mutation has to be found to actually cause an impairment of the function of the gene. So there's got to be some functional assessment related to that specific variant or mutation that is identified to actually make sure that it causes that um, that inactivation of the function of the gene. Sometimes we have what we call variants of uncertain significance where there is a mutation in one of those genes, but we don't have functional assessment proving that it causes that um, change in function. So it's not, um, it's not considered pathogenic in that case. We also have to keep in mind that a normal result, which can occur in up to 15%, does not ex exclude TSC or have an effect on clinical diagnosis. And some patients will be what we call mosaic. So when, what we see here in this imaging is a representation of uh, patients that are mosaics. So, uh, and that can happen in different stages during the during mutation of the cells. So if it happens later on, as we see here, we have just one cell among all those cells that mutated. So we won't have as many um, parts of the body with the mutation. And this makes the diagnosis harder because we're not talking about a germline mutation where we're able to identify with regular DNA testing. And you actually have to test sometimes uh, like a tissue that has that mutation, such as such as the skin. When there is a skin uh, lesion that's typical for TSC, that can be sent for testing. And also that mutation that causes the mos mos mosaic can also happen early on. And then in that case, we'll have more cells uh, that are changed, and those are usually easier to diagnose and can be as severe as some of the germline mutations. This is what we call a somatic mutation. 
So some diagnostic considerations, the, diagnos the diagnosis can happen at any age. So don't be surprised if you see patients uh, later on in their adult lives having a diagnosis of TSC. I actually had uh, patients as late as 60 years old in my clinic that came to me with a new diagnosis. And those patients, they need, they need just as much care and surveillance as other patients um, because they will still need to do all the tests to make sure that other organs don't have severe um, disease. So we also have the in, in utero diagnosis, like I said, now with more techniques for genetic testing that that uh, that diagnosis can be made very early on. So you have to maintain a high index of suspicion and be aware of different manifestations because patients will have different presentations. If one of them is present, try to investigate the others because they may not fit all the criteria for diagnosis, but if you don't investigate the other symptoms, you may not actually see what is happening for sure. And age does not necessarily determine sim symptomatology. So, for example, young patients will usually not have severe kidney involvement, but they still need surveillance regarding uh, kidney disease. And they do not necessarily have intellectual disability. I actually have quite um, a good amount of patients in my clinic that have com complete normal intellect, although they may still suffer from other neuropsychiatric symptoms. Uh, about one third of them only will have significant cognitive disability. So when you think about TSC, don't think about patients with severe intellectual disability. They can range from severe to actually normal. And if a diagnosis is made, always remember to ask about family members. So one situation that's quite common that I see is um, patients will tell me, oh no, there's no one in the family. And then if you start asking more, but then is there anyone in your family with some skin lesions? So maybe ask them if they have some hypomelanotic lesions or, or something uh, in their nails that could look like a fibroma. And then you actually find that some of them have milder forms of TSC. So this is also very important. And then obviously I couldn't uh, not talk about a little bit epilepsy because it's, it's my field, but I won't go over it um, very much in detail because that would be a whole um, talk in itself. But epilepsy in TSC is quite prevalent and can range from 62 to 93% of the patients. Most patients will present before the age of one and you can see really any seizure type, and it can be easy to control to very difficult to control. The, the sad part is that up to 50% of them are actually refractory, which is much higher in terms of numbers when we compare with other etiologies for epilepsy. And epilepsy in general, we would have uh, up to 40% max, uh, 30 to 40, so 50% is quite high for those patients. And uh, age of onset also and severity will vary. Like I said, it can be easy to treat, it can be very refractory, and this will determine a lot of their cognitive and behavior outcomes. So patients with worse seizures, they will uh, also present with worse um, cognitive decline and behavior, behavior issues as well. When it comes to treatment of epilepsy, we've come a long way over the years. So there are many different medications available in the market. So we've, we've um, gone through first generation to second generation. Now we are in the third generation of drugs where we see some of the drugs being more um, targeted to the mechanism of the disease. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about Everlimus, for example. We also have other drugs that have been used for TSC with great success, uh, such as cannab cannabidiol that has some mechanisms that seem to um, also change a little bit of the M mTOR uh, pathway. So um, there are many different um, treatments that don't only, not only include medication and TCG medications, but also we have neuromodulation with VNS, DBS, and RNS, which is not available in Canada yet. Uh, there's resective surgery where sometimes you see that there's a tuber causing that this, the, the seizures and that can be resected. And there's also diet, uh, there's ketogenic diet or other modified types such as modified Atkins or low glycemic index. 
Uh, and then I could not um, not talk about TAN. So TAN has been um, something we've been discussing a lot lately in conferences, especially the ones related to TSC, because uh, what we've been seeing as those patients are, are getting older now with the newer treatments and the overall uh, survival rate of them increasing is that uh, we don't only have intellectual disability as one of the symptoms, but we also have a lot of patients with autism, ADHD, anxiety and depression is also very common. All the behavior issues uh, can happen. So from aggression uh, to like sleep problems, even um, psychosis, different things can happen. Um, and even the mild forms where they don't have intellectual disability, they can still have issues with attention, dual tasking, memory recall, so different domains of their cognition. And then also the psychosocial level is, is severely impacted. So there are issues with self-esteem, uh, parental stress, relationship difficulties. So when it comes to treatment, like I said, we've come a long way, especially when it comes to targeted treatments to the mTOR pathway. Uh, this is, uh, this is an, a map of uh, showing where Easter Island is, which is in the middle of the Pacific. There's not much around it. Uh, but the reason why I'm bringing this is because um, the uh, Everlimus was first disco discovered in this island. It was first used as an antifungal therapy and then later on discovered to be um, an immunosuppressant. And then at some point, somebody decided to use it in uh, rats and, and mouse uh, with uh, tuberous girls with, the, with the, that mutation and then saw that it would uh, actually decrease progression and even shrink some of those tumors. So it was named after, rapamycin was uh, named after um, the native name of the island, which is Rapa Nui. So then after that, there's been several trials testing the efficacy and safety of Everolimus with, uh, I'll show a few ones, but exist one, for example, was targeted for subependymal um, giant astrocytoma, like I showed SEGA, and it had really good results. Then we also had exist two, which uh, tested Everolimus for angiomyolipomas in the kidneys, we had uh, EXIST-3, which was a little bit more controversial uh, with for treatment-resistant focal onset seizures. So there's also evidence that Everlimus can decrease the frequency of seizures, although it's not approved uh, in every country. I believe in Canada is a bit more difficult to get it for that indication alone. And then uh, again, moving into the era of precision medicine, one of the things that has been uh, brought up many times in, in conferences is the EPISTOP trial. So now we talk more about prevention therapy and how we can target the disease in a way that we prevent those patients from actually developing severe intellectual disability and all the neuropsychiatric comorbidities that I showed. So this trial, they actually used vagabatrin uh, early on if, if the EG abnormalities were identified, and this was uh, deemed to be safe and modify the natural history of seizures in TSC, reducing the risk and severity of epilepsy, which in turn could lead to a better brain development overall. Surveillance is very complex for those patients. I'm not gonna go over this whole table, but this is just to give an idea. When those patients come to the clinic, I have this exact same table and I reference it, uh, I always look at it to kind of have an idea when I should or be ordering those tests. So a lot of them have to be done annually and you have to make sure that the patients are seeing all the specialists on time and having the tests done. So now I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about some of the challenges in TSC care because um, it seems like my impression is we've come a long way when it comes to treatment and uh, guidelines, surveillance and all of that. But what we still haven't mastered is how we're going to take care of, of such a complex population, right? It requires a whole team of people to actually do that. 
So uh, the other thing that is very important is uh, there's a great burden of disease in those patients. So not only the patients, but also the families. What a lot of studies have shown is that they feel like there's insufficient assistance at home and from social services. There's also a, a significant use of the healthcare service. And even if they do have access to a lot of uh, specialists, they still feel like they could get more support from TSC associations, for example, patient organizations, and even healthcare as well has been uh, a great issue. And this will all in turn impact. Oh, sorry. sorry, my watch is talking to me. But this will all in turn impact um, the, 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 the individual's education, employment, and social and family life. And uh, just to keep in mind, um, prognosis of those th the patients will vary, and it really depends on how severe some of those manifestations are. Uh, in general terms, the deaths are usually related to sudden ex unexpected death in epilepsy. Also, the um, lung manifestations with the uh, lamb and the kidney issues. Uh, this is just a slide showing the burden of illness, according to this work from 2020. Um, quality of life, both in children and adolescents, was reported with moderate severe levels of pain and discomfort, as you see here. Also, anxiety and depression were quite high, and this was also indicated by uh, the patient's caregivers. And then another big issue, which is another uh, area that I like to study, is transition. So um, the issue with transition of patients with TSC is that um, we're moving from a family-centered, uh, which is the pediatric care, to a patient center, which is the adult care system. So that's a very difficult transition. And transition actually means we don't just transfer the patient, we just don't make a referral. We actually have a slow process where there should be a coordination of care with all the specialists involved, which sometimes, a lot of times actually doesn't happen. And the issue is that um, we expect that youth to behave as an adult, but sometimes they don't want to grow, they don't want to take responsibilities. It is overwhelming to take care of themselves, especially with a chronic disease such as uh, TSC. And the issue is not just from the patient side, but also a lot of neurologists have reported not feeling comfortable, for example, treating patients that come from the pediatric uh, system. So this has been an issue now with those patients uh, slowly having, um, not slowly, but surviving more into adulthood, and then they will become part of the adult care system as well. Um, this is just uh, an article that I, I've recently been a part of, uh, of this publication, uh, January this year, where we uh, looked at patients that were transitioning with epilepsy, and we actually looked how different it was access to specialty care between uh, all the specialists that are listed here um, between pediatric and adult care. So we saw, for example, psychology, dietitian, speech therapist, pediatric uh, years, they had a lot more access to those than in adult years. And then when it comes to quality of care, there were also some different differences um, in like sufficient time during visits. Um, that was that wasn't very relevant. But uh, other things like helping readily available were also issues for those patients. And then this was another article that uh, was uh, a part of led by Mark Kieser. And um, this was published in 2021, and this was specific for TSC patients. And it was just showing how adults uh, with TSC, they actually don't get all the subspecialty care that they should be getting. So we see here uh, cardiologists, for example, only 11%, uh, nephrologists only 47%, although a, a great uh, portion of those patients will have kidney disease. So it's quite concerning. And it was also from this article that um, we also got an idea that um, a lot of patients never had a brain MRI, so that was as high as 16%. And then abdominal MRI, 27% uh, of them never had it, and 45% never had an EKG. 
So it's, it was quite concerning uh, the, in terms of results. When it comes to TSC care, like I said, we do need a big team of experts. Um, optimal care will require that comprehensive approach. And you cannot just treat one manifestation without being aware of all the past potential manifestations. So those are all the specialists that sometimes have to be involved. And um, then I'll just go into the later part uh, where I'll try to bring some of the some of the literature that we have out there in terms of trying to improve care for those patients and how we at MacMaster are trying to to provide better care for those patients as well. So again, in, the, in this era that we are entering now uh, with precision medicine being a part of a lot of chronic conditions um, and other conditions in general, in epilepsy, we are moving a lot towards having more genetics supplied into the care of those patients. And in TSC is no different because we, uh, we're trying to understand more, their research is trying to understand more the mechanisms of the, the disease. So Everlimus now has been even tested in infants. So there's uh, some first uh, results from this observational study. This was published just a few years ago, uh, just showing that Everlimus can be started early on for patients with West syndrome, which is when they have the, the infantile spasms, and that has been successful in treating spasm and, ips, spasm and ipsorythmia, and will uh, also contribute to better development in general. So again, trying to like halt that progression of the disease seems to be the trend now and what um, a lot of researchers are trying to do. Um, so, uh, again, here it just shows that uh, the initial insult is when we can have an early diagnosis, and then there's a latent period where we have EG epileptiform activity prior to even having seizures, and then we know that vigabatrin can be used. Can we use other other things that would target the mTOR pathway as well? I don't think we have the answers for that yet, but maybe in the future we will have if we can actually start those patients on Everlimus, CBD, ketogenic diet, and then after the seizures develop, that's when you may introduce other anti-seizure medications. And then if they become drug resistant, then you have all the, all the other uh, possibilities of treatment. But the fact is, when you look at the latent period, there's way less brain lesion, brain abnormalities. And then as you progress, towards um, a more drug-resistant epilepsy, then you add comorbidities and you add um, a lot more disease burden to those patients. Uh, when it comes to transition, there's a, a lot of ways of uh, improving care for those, for those patients, but just a few ones uh, that were proposed in this article in 2018, specifically for TSC patients. So there are provincial guidelines in Ontario for transition in epilepsy patients, but this one was uh, tailored more for TSC. So it does say to try to identify a healthcare provider in charge of the transition, if it's gonna be the geneticist or the neurologist, there, there's gotta be one person coordinating the care. Obviously you wanna involve uh, the patients and also you can involve support organizations, social workers and other, um, other um, healthcare providers. And then you also have to be realistic of what you have available to you. So you're gonna to have to choose a transition model that's gonna fit uh, the context and then try to compose a clinical summary. And those patients are very complex. So they often come to the adult care setting without a lot of information that happened throughout the years and the parents will not have those records available necessarily. Um, and then we can also educate physicians about TSC. So this is something that there's been an effort in Ontario to try to increase awareness and is the reason why I decided to present about TSC today. Um, also remember that transition can start as early as 13 years old, 12 even, uh, introduce and discuss the process of transition, try to start identifying what are the resources available for those patients. And then later on, when they are 16 even, you may already want to put some referrals in place and then try to initiate that uh, transition process and um, also identify available and appropriate 
areas where the TSC clinic can take place. So uh, there's also this very interesting article I found from 2019, which is try and establish multidisciplinary care for those patients. So we're very early on at McMaster with that. Um, the pediatric team has been uh, with Robin, with me, have, has been doing it for a bit longer. Um, but I think we are probably like around step two, I would say, um, where we have um, not just a patient and, and family partnership with, with um, some of us taking care of the coordination of care, but now we have been able to identify to identify kind of a core team. And uh, as neurologists, we're trying to coordinate the care between the other specialists, but the other specialists also are involved in trying to coordinate the care. And then hopefully we will be getting to the point where we will be recruiting more members um, to include more physician specialists that we need and other healthcare providers that we need that we don't have yet. And then um, finally, if we get to that stage, then um, add more and more specialists that are needed. We can even talk about uh, doing like research related to that. And hopefully we will be getting to those later stages as well. And uh, this is just to say that um, there's been this effort in Ontario, uh, starting this TSC network, uh, for which Dr. Robin Whitney, uh, from, who is a pediatric neurologist, is one of the leaders in this. I've been able to be a part of this group uh, and have been to the two conferences that were held in Toronto, um, 2022 and 2023. So with that, a lot of specialists are trying to gather to one, uh, increase awareness, and then try to educate more people, uh, not just providers, but also patients about TSC and try to establish like those hub centers, um, clinics where we're able to coordinate care across specialties. So that's a very important initiative. Um, and with that, I'd just like to finish with my last slide where um, I have the names of the wonderful people that I've been able to work with. Uh, in the adult care system, and then some from the pediatric that were provided by, by uh, Dr. Robin Whitney. All those specialists have been um, very um, involved in taking care of patients with um, tuberculosis, and it has been wonderful really seeing how um, they can get better care just by having more people involved and interested in caring for this complex population. So I'll just leave this slide now uh, with my email if anyone wants to contact me. Um, the TSC clinic uh, runs um, from, from the adult side uh, once a month uh, for a full day. It is getting uh, more and more referrals, but I still uh, believe that there's a lot, of, a lot more patients out there that still need coordination of care. And I'm happy to... Um, take any questions or comments after that. Thank you so much uh, for uh, this uh, overview, uh, a complex uh, disease with a complex presentation and that touches on many of the specialists who are listening to you today, not only neurology, as you've highlighted. Uh, I will, if you have a question, please uh, put it in the Q&A uh, section or uh, uh, you can raise your hand. I'll bring you in for your uh, to ask your question uh, in, in uh, uh, person. Uh, there is actually, you've, so you've highlighted Dr. Uh, Hampley as one of your collaborators here. And uh, Nathan uh, is asking, you know, as a respirologist, you know, the primary manifestations of TSC, uh, the encounter usually is LAM. Uh, so patients with who presents with idiopathic cystic lung disease, uh, would you recommend screening uh, for LEM with either, uh, sorry for uh, TSC probably meant uh, with either brain MRI or a genetic testing or both? That's a great question. I'm, I'm not just sure what is the incidence of just isolated TSC related to cystic lung disease, but it does seem like a good consideration. Um, like one easy thing to do is just a skin exam, right? To see if there's any manifestations. Sometimes they will not tell you about those uh, skin manifestations, but I think 
because the brain MRI is so sensitive, I would think that could be um, something considered. But now with the way genetic testing is and uh, how available it is and with the cost being significantly less, I would even consider genetic testing even before MRI. I'm not sure if that's that aligns with uh, what everyone uh, thinks. Uh, maybe um, I see Dr. Whitney also had a question. Dr. Whitney um, has more experience. I don't know if you have any um, comments regarding the um, Dr. Hambly's question, but I would think even genetic testing could be done first if that's that's readily available. Uh, thank you, uh, Paula. And I would say if anyone, if uh, Dr. Whitney or Hambly, if anyone wants to comment in person, please raise your hand and I'll bring you in uh, to uh, expand and comment. Uh, so actually, you did uh, not. Dr. Whitney does have another question. If no one else is going to comment on this, uh, Paula, and the question is, you touched on a little bit in your presentation, but this question is about uh, uh, surveillance uh, monitoring in adults uh, and your experience with uh, are the uh, surveillance are up to date and uh, are you finding uh, or are you finding there's lagging behind uh, in surveillance, which is looks like a key issue with the GSC? Yeah. Unfortunately, there's a lot of lagging. Um, I'd say if the patient comes from academic centers, we've had some patients from Toronto, I've had some patients coming from McMaster Children's Hospital, those are usually up to date. Uh, the problem is uh, the patients who are in the community, uh, oftentimes they don't have that surveillance updated, or if there's a gap, in the transition between pediatric and adult care, which often happens as well, they will go years without surveillance because they didn't have a neurologist taking care of them or didn't have someone to take care of that coordination of care. So I'm actually finding it to be quite concerning in terms of those patients not having the appropriate surveillance. Uh, great, uh, great point. Uh... There's multiple comments, uh, Dr. Markey, multiple comments about how great is the token. Thank you uh, so much, comments on the on the chat, in the chat, and praise to the uh, approach of the multidisciplinary clinics. Uh, question from uh, uh, Dr. Langtree uh, around uh, uh, the variation uh, of the presentation of TSC1 and TSC2 uh, in terms of clinical uh, presentation and tissue involvement, um, uh, do you, he's asking whether you have any knowledge of uh, any hypothesis uh, uh, explaining that uh, variation. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a few hypotheses, but I don't think we fully understand yet. Um, for example, the second hit mechanism explains some of those mutations causing more tumors, right? It seems like there's an initial mutation, and then another one that happens later on that causes some of that cell growth, and then explain some of those tumors. And, and then there's there's other signaling in the pathways, in the mTOR pathway, that I don't think we fully understand. I think it really depends on, on the size of the mutation as well in the gene. And uh, I, I just don't think we are there yet with um, with genetics to kind of understand why and even some patients will have like a, a for example when it comes to epilepsy i often get surprised that some patients have a have a big disease burden on the mri but they never had a seizure or they're seizure free whereas i see patients that are extremely refractory and they don't have as many tubers, but they still have this very difficult to control epilepsy with the Lennox Castell phenotype. So I can't really understand that. I feel like there's more to just what we see in the surface as well. Some something maybe related to, to the gene function that we could only understand probably with with more advanced genetic testing and studies in the future. And that's that's what I believe, but I don't think we have that answer yet. Thank you. I, I, I'm really pleased as I listen to all of this uh, and the complexity of uh, uh, TSC itself, but also the complexity of transition of care between uh, pediatric and adult. And you said something really resonates well, you know, so it's moving from uh, uh, 
a more patient, sorry, a family focused uh, to, uh, care to a patient focused care and whether the patient wants to do that or not. And, and sometimes, you know, in other diseases, maybe also in TSCs, whether they are able to do that or not uh, to accept themselves as, as an individual adult. And in Hamilton, in Hamilton Health Sciences, and uh, we, we at McMaster, we do uh, some disease specific transitions very well. And in general, we don't do unfortunately great in that transition. I'm really pleased to hear about your interest and the work you've done around uh, around that uh, and the need for lots of coordination. Why I'm saying all of this is when I want to hear more about your perspective of how we can move forward. I love how you're doing that multidisciplinary, but we know that resources is, is limited. I really like the study you quoted about, you know, how much you know exposure to multi to specialties is happening in pediatrics versus in adult and uh, uh, moving forward, you know, in uh, Hamilton, how we can do this. The other pieces in my mind with these complex diseases is who uh, the center of care is always the patient, but who is the center of care in terms of a provider, which specialist you're talking about multiple specialties. I hear here is a lot about the neurologist. Uh, we see a lot of diseases. Is it the family doctor? Is it the internist? Is it really the cardiologist? And how we can navigate that and how we can help the patient navigate that when in pediatrics, it's a lot of the work is done around the pediatrician, but not as truly the pediatrician, but the pediatrician's team. I know I've said a lot, but I'd like to hear more of reflections from you of how we can move forward with this in Hamilton, because it is an issue that we need to resolve sooner or later. Uh, yeah. For this disease and many other diseases. For sure. I mean, that center on the on the coordination of care could be really anyone. Um, the thing that has been happening with uh, that is that because epilepsy is such a prevalent condition in those patients, some neurologists have started doing that coordination of care. But in Ontario, for example, there is for example, a doctor in, in Toronto that works, um, she, uh, I believe her, she was a family doctor and then she decided to work mostly with TSC patients. And then she does that in collaboration with some geneticists and she has, or she coordinates the care for adult patients with TSC in Toronto. Uh, so it could really be anyone interested. I know a lot of the specialists that are involved in the care of these patients at McMaster, they also have been doing some of that coordination of care. Uh, I think it's just a matter of putting that in a more formal way and creating that as a clinic and having, um, I mean, obviously we would need more resources, right? Somebody to at least a clinic coordinator. And if we had one person that would be helped, like, like trying to access all those, those referrals, all those tests, that could already be a good start, right? Increasing communication. I see there's a comment um, from Dr. Lentry as well about overcoming challenges, match messaging each other. So it's a big issue. Like I'll give you an example. The other day I was seeing a patient with um, with a fellow from nephrology actually that came to the TSC clinic. And um, if he hadn't told me that I could check for the pathology results of the kidney uh, uh, pathology after removal of a tumor and dovetail, I would never know that that was revised. So actually the initial pathology result was one, and then the, the second revised one was different and more concerning. So I would never have checked on those two, and it was not on Clinical Connect. It's not just communicating. There's, a, there's an issue with all the system and integrating all that information. So I think there's still a lot that we need to do. Obviously the system is better and a lot, a lot more integrate, integrated than it used to be, but there's still, challenges when it comes to caring for those patients. If they do the tests elsewhere outside of Hamilton, for example, then it becomes an issue again to have those results uh, back to us. So there's a lot of things. And this is just Hamilton, right? What What is happening outside of Hamilton, like northern part of Ontario, like areas that don't have all the specialists available? How are they doing that care? So it's it's very, very complex. And I see there's a few more comments in the in the chat. Yeah, no, great, great, great points. And again, you know, that we were focused on you there's a great point about, you know, what's happening really to patients. And that's where when you put the slides on surveillance, it's really disappointing to see that patients have made it to adulthood with limited uh, 
uh, surveillance, and that is probably related to access of care, which we know that we struggle in many areas of the province. Uh, so that's a, a great point. The, the comments in, include that, you know, which is similar, but you said that there, there are some there are different different specialists depends on the on the on the burden of the disease and you know some areas is cardiology some areas is genesis and some areas is family physician which is uh could be confusing to the patients and how do we identify that formally as you've highlighted great yeah. uh, great uh, point and to to matt you know i'll bring it up with our uh, uh epic team can we ever really improve on even the communication uh, between Dovetail and Epic, which is very interesting. We cannot, we have to go into front, from one system to another to message each other. Uh, there's no unified system at the moment, uh, uh, which is key. Uh, I, I think there's also a comment from Dr. Shapiro, which is, I don't want to have it uh, missed. It's probably related to the question on TSC1 and TSC2. It's uh, the talk that it actually suggests that the, the size of the structure of the structure uh, of a specific tube, a tuber uh, could uh, be important to epilepsy. Or yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. There has been a lot of advancements in uh, epilepsy surgery related to tuber uh, resection, but uh, the fact is that even with that, sometimes we don't achieve uh, seizure freedom. So there's, there's, there's a lot more, I think, that we don't understand well. Um, which is why I still get surprised sometimes how some patients have really no seizures and still have a lot of tubers. So, yeah. Interesting. On that, on that note, I wanted to, you, you've mentioned C, uh, sorry, surgery previously and right now about as an option of treatment. Can you tell us a little bit about where we are with the uh, seizures for epilepsy in, uh, our, for our population? I know it's not available yet in Hamilton, but it's in the planning. Uh, so we can take a couple of minutes on that if it's so, okay. Well, you. actually, we've uh, the, the program here that is led by Dr. Shapiro. Um, we've started the, in collaboration with Neurosurgery. We've started doing some surgeries here at Hamilton. So okay, we've been able to do uh, send patients for vagus nerve stimulation and simple, uh, not sure, but lo lobectomies and other simple surgeries. The more complex cases are still sent to London mostly, um, but that hopefully will change in the future with us having a bigger department. But the department has grown. Uh, we're now five epileptologists and hopefully we'll have more of those resources available, but they're still accessible through London or sometimes even Toronto, depending on, on patient preference. So it, we have to keep in mind the resources are out there and um, they can be uh, like, they can be accessed if uh, needed, right? So it, uh, epilepsy surgery has come a long way over the years, but with uh, diseases like TSC, the refractoriness is worse than other types of um, diseases. So it's just, there's still a lot more that, uh, like I said, we still need to understand. And the morbidity is very high in those patients. They are very, they're very um, complex in a, in a way that sometimes some of those appointments will take even like two hours to just go over um, everything that needs to be uh, covered. And sometimes it's not even enough. So we definitely need more people interested in doing this work and then people to help with the coordination as well. Fantastic. I'm just looking at uh, a comment from uh, Dr. Whitney related to uh, epilepsy surgery is underutilized in TSC population yeah. through their benefit from surgery, often not investigated due to their complexity. And again, That's you know, the, 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 hopefully the solution to that is now we do have uh, an epilepsy uh, service that is really well staffed. Uh, it's, it's been a while trying to build the service and uh, with five epileptologists, that, uh, Fabulous, right? Uh, uh, and hopefully we'll have better access for our patients, at least locally. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the department was 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 already there. It's just the surgery that was had to be uh, referred to London. But uh, I think it's been a long time since we had at least three beds in the epilepsy monitoring unit. So the patients were still being investigated. The problem is that there's still a lack of referrals coming to us for those patients to be investigated. And like Dr. Whitney is saying, sometimes people, uh, some physicians would just believe that because they have intellectual disability and all the comorbidities, they're not even good surgical candidates in the first place, and they're never investigated. So they really should be investigated no matter what. Fantastic. Uh, 
Thank you again, uh, Dr. Marquis, for this fantastic presentation. Great overview of uh, disease. We don't, you know, in in uh, in general listen about hear about much. You know, uh, that that the complex patient that in front of one of us as a providers, and to hear about the great work you're uh, doing with the team you're working with into the in multidisciplinary interprofessional approach, and hopefully continue to try to resolve the transition between pediatric and adult, not only for this disease, but more uh, complex diseases here in Hamilton and the area we serve, the population we serve. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I uh, wish everyone uh, a good rest of their day. Thank you. Thank you.